11 and 12. Let me reread those for 12 and 13. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And those are some big verses there because it talks right in those two little few words about the changes that God made in the world with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. You know, last week was Easter. We have the resurrecting flowers. Every year they come up this time of year, don't they? And we know it's Easter. And Christ on the cross, we see that picture. Pete made reference to that earlier in the Sunday school. We see the picture of Christ on the cross. And that's what a lot of people focus on. But it was the resurrection that made it real. Without the resurrection, there would have just been a dead prophet, which a lot of religions out there in the world today consider Christ as having been. But Christ was the Son of God, is the Son of God, and his resurrection is what made all this true. Now, I want to look this morning, as I get into my notes here, on some of those people that were without hope in the world. And the nation of Israel that had the covenants and the, and the promises. When Christ came to the cross, it was the fulfilling of that promise that God had made before the world began. But before the world began was a long time ago. Look, turn to First Timothy and Titus. Get Titus 1, 2, and I said 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy is correct, I believe. <laughs> uh, these are some good verses that need to keep in mind behind all of what God did with mankind. First, uh, 2 Timothy verse 1 Paul an apostle chapter 1 verse 1 excuse me Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus and then verse 9 who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. And Titus 1 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You know, before the world began, in eternity past, how, how long is eternity? <laughs> it's like, an infinity of time, isn't it? I remember when my little grandsons used to got all tied up with the word infinity. What's an infinity of infinities, Grandpa? Well, that's a long time, too. That's double long time. But back before the world began, think about it. God, the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit together decided to create the heavens and the earth Genesis 1 right? they decided to create mankind and beside that to protect that they decided to provide a savior Jesus Christ, the Son, a 
agreed eternity past to die for our sins. Eternity past, he promised to go to the cross and not only bear our sin, but bear the separation from the Father that he had to go through to be able to take our sins for us. Then for a little time, from eternity past, until Christ went to the cross. Had a lot of time to think about it, didn't he? Think about that. You know, you, you've got a horrible toothache. You have to go to the dentist. And, uh, okay, so you, you want to go to the dentist and get the toothache over with. But you dread going to the dentist. And going through that extra pain or whatever it is that we're going to have to go through before we get rid of, of what we've been putting up with all this time. So we put up. But, but Christ is a poor example, I know. But think again about eternity past and the knowledge God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had of the coming separation from them with Christ on the cross that they were going to have to bear. There was a sacrifice together that was made. And they had a long time to think about it. They could have backed out, couldn't they? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. But that isn't what God does. God it, it cannot lie, promised, before the world began, a Savior. I already read this verse, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, when we read Ephesians, go back to Ephesians, Ephesians 2, uh, says in verse... 14, for he is our peace, Ephesians 2.14, <coughs> who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, combined in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now here again we're talking back about our folks in verse 11, verse 12 that are in the world without hope, without covenants and promises. So we need to look at what God did in the beginning. Adam and Eve came and was created and Adam and Eve failed God, did they not? They, they sinned, and God cast them out of the garden. But as soon as they sinned, they had need of something, didn't they? What did they have need of? They had need of a Savior. But it was already there. God had already provided it. Genesis 3.15. So... It is the first place that we hear about in, in the Bible. If we get the Bible and open it up and don't read Second Timothy and Titus, we're not going to know that. <laughs> you know what? I think I need that, huh? Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. And maybe it'll make me sound better. Who knows? And anyway, where was I? <laughs> I was here talking about Adam and Eve failing and God it, in the first instance in the Bible of where he declares a savior for mankind. Doesn't give us all the details about it, but he declares a savior for mankind. And, and 
God goes on. Boy. Excuse me. And after Adam and Eve are out of the garden and, uh, and they go into the world and the world multiplies, we find that, uh, that there's a problem. There's a problem in the world because all of man has corrupted himself, both spiritually and, and fleshly. And God calls Noah. Now, there was one thing that Adam and Eve left the garden with that they didn't have before. Any ideas? What happened when Eve bit the apple and Adam ate thereof also? Why? How did, why did they feel they were naked? brought knowledge to them because they had they attained the knowledge of good and evil they became as gods that was Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve that they would be as gods knowing the difference between good and evil when God put them out of the garden they had a conscience that a, a knowledge of good and evil and they knew what were the right things to do and what were the wrong things to do when Cain slew Abel, he knew what was right and what was wrong. When he gave the wrong sacrifice, he knew what was right and what was wrong. But down through the generations, mankind dulled that, that conscience by re rebelling against what God, what was the right thing to do, I'd do what I want to do instead of what the right thing to do. So we get to Noah, and God has picks out Noah and his family and saves out the world. And we get then to the Tower of Babel. Let's skip the in between there. We get to the Tower of Babel and again mankind is rebelling against God. They put away all of the guidance that God has given them that he wants them to follow. And they've fallen into a total rebellion against God. God then scatters them around the world and we have all the different languages and everything from, from that uh, point on. But shortly after that God calls Abraham. Now at the Tower of Babel how was God dealing with mankind? He was dealing with them directly through people he may have chosen to speak to or with and give them guidance and direction to help them control that conscience and see things as God would have them be seen. But things are looking pretty bad so God calls Abraham and he starts to deal with Abraham and his descendants in a special way. Now he doesn't quit dealing with the rest of the world there's lots of other folks out there in the world besides Abraham and his descendants. But for 500 years, approximately, God is dealing with Abraham and his descendants. A good portion of those years are it, it, Egypt is in uh, uh, Israel's, Israelites are in Egypt, excuse me, during that time. They're there for uh, 500 years. But all during that time, God is still dealing with the rest of the world, dealing with them in, uh, in different ways. Chapter 4, 14 in Genesis, God, uh, Abraham runs into Melchizedek, king of the Mo Most High, priest of the Most High of Salem. Turns out to be Jerusalem. We have uh, Abraham went into and Sarah went down into Egypt, if you recall, I think the first time. They was only 75 years old then. And uh, King Abimelech took Sarah. That's the story. you got to read that story. Anyhow, he, he knew that was wrong. It came to him in a vision that that was the wrong thing to do. God was speaking to him and other people in Egypt, other people around the world, everywhere. Because that promise that God made before the world was for all mankind, all mankind. And then we have 
Jethro, who was Moses' father-in-law, was the priest of Midian. So God was ministering to people of Midian through Jethro, who turns into to be Moses' father-in-law. Now, when we get to this point in time, we've got Egypt, we've got Israel in Egypt. And they're, uh, they went down there as guests, and they were there at that time as slaves. Time for God to raise them up and do something with them. So turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Uh, starting there in verse 17, 18, 19, somewhere around in there and reading all through the rest of that chapter up at up to verse 28 is all about the, the world and how they were uh, and what what they did with that conscience, that knowledge of good and evil that God did. And it seems like they did everything possibly wrong or, uh, or wrong, certainly wrong in God's eyes, but I don't mean wrong, I mean immoral and in rebellion against God. Once again, the, the whole world is in rebellion against God. In this context, we've just gotten here. Now, my mind frame is God called Abraham. He what dealt with his people. He set up and prepared ahead of time. In answer to this, Romans one twenty eight. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The whole world. Where would we be today if the Bible stopped there? The whole world God gave over to a reprobate mind. But that doesn't mean that the promise that he made of a savior for all mankind went away for those folks it didn't mean that he quit loving them but what it did mean was he turned them over to a reprobate mind and led them to their own devices to do what they desired to do without his interacting with them anymore in the world without covenant without hope what do we have now? We have a bunch of lost people in the world. The world's full of lost people. And God's not dealing with them anymore. Uh, praise the Lord, he had a plan beside that. And we get to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. This, I think chronologically, I'm could be somebody would like to argue with that but I don't think so <laughs> Exodus chapter 11 and now of course we're at the point where we've gone through the plagues of uh, God uh, putting the plagues on Egypt and essentially conquering Egypt and calling the Israelites out of uh, out of Egypt but here's something significant that happens here. A lot of significant things happened here, excuse me. <laughs> the Passover and then all of the following history of God dealing with Israel. But here, in verse 7, it says, But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that he doth, that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. 
the Egyptians represented the the world. They represented the, they were the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And God put a distinction between the Israelites and all other nations of the world. <clears throat> and he did that for a reason, to raise them up to be what? Exodus 19, 5 and 6. We all know those verses. God raised Israel up to be a nation of priests. Verse 6, if ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God called Israel up to be a nation of priests, to be God's ministers to the Gentiles. You know, Exodus 11, 7, we just got Gentiles. That's where us Gentiles came from. Before, we were all just mankind, sons of Adam. And here, we became Gentiles. Those folks that are so despised when we get into the New Testament, we talk about the Gentiles. How in the world did we get to be so bad? Well, it's because way back then, <laughs> God, man just seared his conscience, it tells us in Timothy. So, we became the Gentiles, the Gentiles and the Jews, all that story. And, and all of the Bible that we have that talks about Israel, that's a lot of the Bible that talks about Israel. Look at that. That's a whole bunch. You know what all that is? All that is, is God trying to deal with the Israelites and get them to live their lives in the way that he would have them to live their lives so that they could be that kingdom of priests and, and give to the rest of the world that he had given over to a reprobate mind. Turn to Isaiah chapter 49. Find it here. Isaiah chapter 49. And verse 6. <clears throat> the Lord says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. <clears throat> God raised Israel up, and so we have some verses in there also that say to, excuse me, that uh, above all nations, he raised them up above all nations. He was their intermediary. For them to have any chance of getting to God, they had to do it through Israel, and they had to do it because of the glory of God being manifested in Israel and a light to the Gentiles. We got to. Oh, I see the countdown is coming. Turn with me to that to Luke. Luke chapter two. And while we're turning to Luke chapter two, uh, I have a sip of water. John 3.16 says God Eric, 
Everybody didn't hear that, but everybody knows that. <laughs> Who did God send his son to? The world. God so loved the world. And that was the Jews and that was the Gentiles. Okay. Don't don't let people get you hung up on that verse because it means what it says. It says what it means. Luke chapter 2. And verse 27, 28. Joseph and Mary are taking Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to do <coughs> to do the circumcision and those things that were that had to be done. And there was a man there named Simeon. And he greets him and he and he says, picks up the son according to and he said, to, oh, 28. And took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, verse 29, Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He saw the God in the flesh the beginning of God's fulfilling of that promise that had been made before the world began which thou hast prepared before the face of all people not just Israel but all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel so Christ was to come as the glory of Israel so that Israel could be a light to the Gentiles. That's the program that God had set up way back here with beginning in Exodus. But Israel never fulfilled that promise, never fulfilled that that. Uh, can't think of the word. Anyhow, they didn't do as they were supposed to do. They never lived up to God's expectations and desires for them. And so that when we get to the New, Co the New Testament, and we're into the this thing right here, now we're going to have the Lord's uh, earthly ministry and then to the cross. When he went to the cross, he when he went to the cross he fulfilled that promise that he had made before the world began it still was not uh, redact to that Redact. Everybody know what the word redact means? <laughs> Heard of that a lot here lately. Well, I have to redact that. It started wrong. <laughs> it was the beginning. Christ's death on the cross was the fulfilling of the promise God made before the world began to all mankind. And when we continue on with the program, Israel, after the rapture, God, uh, Israel will actually achieve that uh, that position of a nation of priests to the Gentiles. They were well. We just have to. We got to do some more redacting. It's time for me to close. <laughs> so I'm running out of time. We read in Ephesians chapter thirteen. Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, verse 13, and uh, the rest of that, the rest of that chapter. The but now, but now in, Je in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. So about 20 years, approximately after Christ died on the cross, the the apostles there had time to deal with 
corporate Israel, the old covenant Israel, and to let them see that Jesus was the Christ. But they stumbled at the cross, it tells us in Romans. They stumbled at the cross. <clears throat> and God called the Apostle Paul and gave the Apostle Paul the message of the, the gospel of grace. At that time, he set aside that program that he had going on with Israel, which was the new covenant program. The new covenant for Israel started at the cross. <clears throat> and again, they had that period of time to implement that with the rest of Israel, and they didn't. But when God called Paul, he set aside that prayer with the nation of Israel, just like all those verses we read about the, the, the glorious salvation that we have through Christ Jesus. Then, I think I'm, I think I'm done. This message has been, I, I have read for three days, and I hope I didn't bore you too much, but there's some wonderful studies in there, a lot of different places you can take off from all those things that I said, and that's the thing to do, study it out, and if I said something you don't agree with it, great, study it out, tell me why I'm wrong but learn from the word. That's what God wants us to do, is to learn from his word. Quit giving guidance through prophets and so on and so forth as he did before he raised up Israel. And he's quit putting a burden between us and God having to go through someone else to get to God. There's one mediator between God and man, the, the man Jesus Christ. And that's it. All we have to do today is pray. We have direct access to Christ. And you know, I, it, love of Christ constraineth us when you think about the time that and eternity Christ had to think about going to the cross and the separation from God that he was going to suffer and it says in Luke 2 44 Christ is praying in the garden right before the crucifixion and he says and being in an agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as, as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He said, Father, not my will but thine. That separation he was going to face is what we all will face if we don't accept Christ as our Savior. It's terrible enough that Christ dreaded it so much. But we can rejoice because, because Christ died for us. That's right. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you this time and I <coughs> and I thank you for your love for us that before we were yet even created you were willing to give up your own life in the separation from the Father for us and we just pray that as we 
go through our life that we would be able to live up to the standards that you've set for us in your word here today and that we'd be able to spread that gospel to folks around us and father hopefully be instrumental in leading someone else to Christ to understand the great love that you showed for us and father we can only return a small amount of that again we thank you for this day and for this time and we pray that Father, that some good will come from the reading of your word this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.